I'm preaching from a text this morning that I'd be hard pressed to find any sermons in my portfolio of sermons where I have preached from this text on a Sunday morning. I've done it several times, several different messages on this text for funerals. But for a Sunday morning, I don't know that I ever have. But this is something that we can all grow from, I hope. This is the Apostle Paul writing this in his second letter to Timothy. This was at a time when he knew he was slipping away and about ready to make his departure from this world to the next. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. May God add his blessing to the reading, the proclamation, the understanding of his holy and blessed word. Charles Spurgeon, that great British preacher of the 20th century, early 20th century, was raised in the Congregationalist Church. But after he got saved, he got convicted. He got convicted by scripture and he wanted to be baptized. He wanted to be baptized by immersion. And he became a Baptist. Well, he wrote his parents asking for their permission. His mother wrote back and says, Dear Charles, I have often prayed the Lord would make you a Christian. But I have never prayed that he'd make you a Baptist. Well, I don't know how interested the Lord is in whether or not you're a Baptist. I'm not really sure how interested I am in whether or not you're a Baptist. But I am interested in whether or not you know the Lord, whether you have a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, that you walk with him, that you understand him, and the relationship that you have as being a child of God. And if that's not where you are today, then I challenge you to make things right. Someone did a study on the Bible and, and, and found out that approximately 300 leaders are chronicled in the Bible. But he followed up in that research and was a little disappointed to learn that less, less than one-fourth of all the leaders in God's word finished well, less than one-fourth. Now, we're all at different stages in our physical growth, just like we're all at different stages of our spiritual growth. I've talked about that over the years a lot. Where you are right now, I hope that you're not where you were a year ago in your own spiritual growth, and you're not where you were physically a year ago. Why should we be that way spiritually? I'm hoping that the older we get, the more we find ourselves in church, the more we find ourselves in God's word, the more we find ourselves in the fellowship of believers, that we're growing and that we're moving forward. I hope that it can be said about us, just as the Apostle Paul said about himself. I have fought a good fight. I've finished the course. I kept the faith. There's a lot that goes through my mind in a day's time. To be honest with you, this little pea brain of mine has a lot that goes through it on a daily basis. Sometimes in the quietness of my own day, when it's just me and God, we're talking, trying to sort out a lot of things, trying to find answers to a lot of questions, trying to find understanding. Sometimes it's early in the morning, Sometimes it's late at night. Sometimes it's in the middle of the day. I do a lot of thinking. Think about me, myself, my relationship to God. I think about the church. I think about you. 
where you are in your relationship with the church. I think about the church as a whole, not just the Pleasant Ridge Baptist Church, although I'm thinking about that too. I'm talking about the bride of Christ, a body of believers unified together, calling ourselves Christians. I think about the church, the churches all across the land. I think about where we are right now as opposed to where we were when I started in ministry 46 or 7 years ago. But a lot of changes have taken place in ministry. So the church faces a secular culture and I see that secular culture becoming increasingly more strident and more militant in its anti-Christian, anti-truth, anti-God approach. I see that all over the place. You know, I, I fear the danger. I fear the danger of facing what I see so many people doing, becoming lukewarm. And you know, we've talked about that. We've preached about that in, in, in the book of Revelation about being lukewarm. We face a world that is becoming more increasingly cold, cold toward the things of God, cold toward the conviction of having a deep, sincere relationship with God. We face the devil, and the devil, in case you don't know it, is alive and well on planet Earth. I believe the devil is saving up his big guns. He's saving up his heavy artillery for the last days. And I think we're walking closer and closer toward the last days. Don't know that it's going to be tomorrow. May not even be during my lifetime. But we're walking closer and closer uh, to that point. And I think that the devil is doing everything he can to get us to give up, to throw in a towel, say it's not worth it. I give up. I give up on church. I give up on my relationship with God. I give up on people. I just give up. That's exactly where the devil wants us to be. I want us to personally, I want us to individually, I want us collectively and corporately as a church to understand where we are in our relationship with God, in our walk with God. Could it be said about us? Could we say about ourselves as the Apostle Paul said about himself? I fought a good fight. I finished the course. I kept the faith. Last words. Last words are really important, aren't they? Found myself in a home about 2 o'clock this one morning this past week. The wife was talking about her husband's last words. I love you, honey. Some nice last words. Interestingly enough, a few days earlier, I heard another person talking about what a loved one's last words were. Wasn't quite that nice. I think about that a lot. I guess I'm around death enough I think about those things. What was his last words? What will be my last words? Will it be things that will be pleasing and honorable to God? Last words I really think are important. I'm convinced that the Apostle Paul wrote these last words that we see recorded in 2 Timothy believing that either he was going to see Jesus or Jesus Christ was coming to see him. He knew that it was soon. He knew that it was evident. Now these words, I look at these words, I ponder uh, these words here. I fought a good fight, I finished the course, I kept the faith. I see those, those words, that passage right there, as being a blueprint, a blueprint for us as Christians and how we can be more committed and do what we need to do until the Lord comes back. I'm speaking to a group of people, at least in the sanctuary. I'm not sure with others within the sound of my voice today. But for you all, I think I'm speaking to people that are convinced the Lord is coming back someday. God's word tells us that. I trust that we believe that. But what do we do? What do we do until he comes back. What's our task? What would the Apostle Paul tell us if he was here today? I believe, first of all, he would say, until the Lord returns, be faithful. Be faithful to the fight. The Apostle Paul is looking back at his past. 
He's getting these visions, these visions and these images of what he has done, what his life has been like, the difference that he has made in the cause of the kingdom. Now, the, both the words fight and fought, I have fought a good fight, really comes from a Greek word. I always like to touch base with you. You're more fresh on Greek than I am, but I didn't get a chance to do that. But you can back me up here, okay? You can cross-reference me and make sure I'm right, Daniel. But both the words fight and fought come from a Greek word, the Greek word agon, which gives us the English word agony, agony. And it literally means conflict. It literally means contest. So when they see the Apostle Paul writing this, he's talking about the conflict that he's having to deal with. Now, Paul was a spiritual soldier. We talked a little bit about that last Sunday night, uh, if, if you were here. He was a spiritual soldier in God's army. And he's reminding us here that every one of us are to be a soldier of Jesus Christ. If we carry that banner, then we have to be a soldier. Now, God doesn't have a volunteer army. Did you know that? He doesn't have a volunteer army. In fact... The truth of the matter is the draft is still in effect. And we've all been drafted. We have been drafted into his work in his service for his kingdom. In 2 Timothy, and this is real close to where we were last Sunday in, in Sunday night's message, but we see 2 Timothy 2, 3 reminding us, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You see, Christianity is not for the faint-hearted. You know, when we, when we came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, the Lord didn't invite us to a picnic, okay? He didn't tell us that everything's going to be peaches and cream. Don't worry about a thing. Life will be lovely. No, that's not what he tells us. He calls us to stand firm and to fight a good fight. I make reference quite a bit to C.S. Lewis because he is one of my favorite writers, but C.S. Lewis quotes, there is no neutral ground in the universe. Every inch, every split second is claimed by God, listen to the rest of it, and counterclaimed by Satan. That's a truthful statement. It's a powerful statement. Every child of God, every one of us, face three foes. We face three enemies. The first being the world, the second being flesh, and the third being the devil. And none of them fight fair. And certainly none of them fight clean. And they, there will never be any ceasefire. And, and there will never be any peace treaties. They're always fighting against us and working against us. So we could call the world the flesh and devil. We could rename it as self, sin, and Satan. Those are all enemies that every one of us have to fight against every day. Now, if you don't believe that there's a war going on out there in this world, turn on the news, turn on the TV. Open up your newspaper. Listen to the radio when you leave here today. Listen to the news. There's a major war going on in this world. It's a war against the flesh. It's a war against self. It's a war against Satan. Now, if we're going to be faithful, we've got to be faithful to the fight and fight to the end. See, I can remember in my years of ministry, just since I've been in the ministry, I can remember when life was sacred. Never heard anything about drive-by shootings. That was the farthest thing from anybody's mind. Even growing up as a kid in California, certainly growing up in Tennessee. Life was something sacred. Brothers killing brothers, family members against family members. Like every time you turn the TV on or listen to the news, you hear of things reflective of life with no sacredness to it. 
I can remember a time in my own ministry when hardcore porn was something you never talked about, you never dealt with. You, and if you were involved with it, and I've known people that have been, you did it in secret. Now it's right there on the newsstands for anybody to buy, anybody to look at. I can remember when children, just since I've been in the ministry, could actually go to school and pray and be able to stand up and say the Pledge of Allegiance. And they could say, without any hesitation, one nation under God. I can remember just in my time of ministry when Christmas was actually called Christmas, not some kind of winter season. It was Christmas, and we weren't ashamed to say the word Christ. I can remember calling them Christmas carols. But things have changed. I can go down the whole list. I could spend the next 30 minutes. I worked on a lot of other stuff that I'm not sharing right now. But it's just reflective of the times. It's reflective of, of how we're not fighting a good fight. We're not taking a stand. We're not doing what the Apostle Paul encouraged us to do. And I'm just wondering when that time comes. Can God say about us, you fought a good fight. You finished the course. You kept the faith. See, we've got to be faithful in our preaching, in faith. We've got to be faithful in our sharing. You know, the, the Southern Baptist Convention statistics are really alarming. I just came across these this week. So they're fresh. They're new. Baptism across the convention plateaued out. Church attendance plateaued out. Sunday school is declining all across the convention. I can't speak for other denominations because I don't have that material. But it all goes back to saying we're not where we once were. As a church, as individuals, as a body of believers across our country, we're slipping away, we're sliding away. We're not where we once were. Now we can go around wringing our hands or walking the floor and trying to come up with all kinds of new programs to get things done, but the bottom line is this. The only remedy for the problem, the only cure for the malady that we see here is getting back to the basics. Getting back to what God's word is telling us. Getting in his word getting back in church, getting back into a relationship. We will never be able to have said, you fought a good fight and finished the course and kept the faith if we're not in his word, having a relationship with him, having a relationship with his people, seeking to know his will, getting back to God's word. And then we also see that until the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, and we've got to be faithful all the way to the finish. All the way to the time we cross that finish line. I'm not talking about a sprint. The Apostle Paul wasn't talking about a sprint. He's talking about a marathon. How many of you have ever ran a marathon? Okay, I've ran a few. Don't ask to see my, my time, okay? Some of them, some of them was pretty good. But one of my most embarrassing times running a race was in Louisville, started at Cox's Park, Went around up there by that fish's, Fisher's Bacon Place and went down through Prospect and around there. About the 18th mile marker, I hit the wall. But I said, I, I got to keep on going. I got to keep on going. I got to keep on going. I did. But my time was almost five hours. That's a long time for a marathon. Four hours and 40 something minutes. It's all printed in the paper, Courier Journal. I cut it out. I'm not showing it to too many people, okay? But when I think about that, I, I think about the Apostle Paul really wasn't too concerned about that stopwatch. I was. I wanted to know what my time was going to be when I crossed that finish line. I really wanted to know if I was going to cross that finish line. But I think what's really important, what God is concerned is not so much the time as it is the fact that we can cross the finish line having fought a good fight 
and meeting God's approval. I have fought a good fight, the Apostle Paul said. Well, I made it good. I've been in some fights that weren't too good. What made this fight? Because it was a fight for God. It was a fight for the cause of what was right. Until he comes back, we must be faithful to the faith. The Apostle Paul said, I have kept the faith. Now, he's really referring to the whole counsel of God. He, he's referring to the sacred scriptures of God's word. I have kept the faith. Now, if you did a little bit of digging in Greek with the word kept, it means to guard as if you are guarding a treasure. Take God's word. Guard it. Guard it is something very special. We must be faithful in defending the faith. Now, this book, this book really is a treasure of truths. And it must be guarded just like the crown jewels in the United Kingdom. They're in the Tower of London, I guess is where it is. They're guarded with the greatest uh, 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 protection. We need to be guarding God's word. We need to be teaching and living out God's word. We, understand, we need to understand that God's word doesn't just talk about heaven. It also talks about the reality of a hell. And we need to be teaching that and living that out and fighting that fight. God's word doesn't just talk about the love of God. It talks about the holiness of God. And God is indeed holy. God's word, the, the sacred scriptures doesn't just talk about the mercy of God. It also talks about the wrath of God. And God's word certainly talks about the pleasures of salvation. But we also need to be reminded it talks about the problem of sin, which brings about the need for salvation to begin with. Talk a lot about faith. We can't really have faith till we have repentance. So we go all through the, the word talking about what we want to talk about, what we want to preach about. But the Apostle Paul was saying, we've got to be faithful in living out and preaching out and sharing out all the sacred scriptures. And when the hounds of heresy were nipping at the Apostle Paul's heels, and guess what? He was fighting a fight, and he fought it to the finish. God is concerned, not so much with how we run the race, but the fact that we finish the race. In verse 8, he talks about the appearing. I don't know when the Lord Jesus Christ is going to reappear. Do you believe he is coming back? Mm, I'm talking to a bunch of people. I'd really be surprised if you said, no, you didn't. But there's people out there that don't, either they don't believe or they don't care that he's coming back. And I don't know when his appearing is, okay? I'm not too worried about that. I just want to be ready. And I do know that his appearing is going to take place. But we take so much. We take so much about life for granted. We take so much about human history for granted. And we forget that someday, just like the Apostle Paul was saying, we're going to cross the finish line, whether we like it or not. We may not fight it. Fight a good fight. We may not have kept the faith. But we're going to cross the finish line. Unless the Lord comes back during our lifetime, the Lord is going to see to it. We, we cross the finish line. It's our choice. It's our decision as to how faithful we're, we're going to be. And then we close out by talking about somebody you'll know a little something about. 1973 I was still in diapers then, if my memory serves me correctly. Something like that. But you'll know the horse by the name of Secretariat. He became a legend in his time. In fact, he was a legend for all time. After 46 years, the effects of that horse, Secretariat, are still gauged as the benchmark for greatness. Watch the movie if you haven't. He was referred to as the, forces, the fastest horse in dirt 
in history. Not only did he win the triple crown, but he did it in performance time. Not only has that race never been duplicated before, but it has not been duplicated since. Not in quite the same way. The Belmont Stakes, the last leg of the Triple Crown. He not only won the race by 31 links. You know what a link is? I had one person this morning that shook his head in the 9 o'clock service. I'll be honest with you. If I knew what it was, I forgot it. And I looked it up. A link is about 8 feet. A length in horse racing is, is the length from the average length from a horse's nose to his tail. That's a length. Eight feet. Now, if Secretary won by 31 lengths, that means he won by some 248 feet. And he was still setting new records along the way because he ran every quarter mile succeedingly faster for a mile and a half that thoroughbred went faster and faster and faster in fact he is accelerating at such an incredible pace that his trainer said if he'd gone one more lap his heart would have exploded now why am I telling that story because that story relates to where we could be or where we should be we need to allow that story to remind us that we are running a race. We need to run that race with endurance, and we need to be running that race so that when we cross that finish line, we can hold our chest up and our head high and say, I'm running the race faster now than I did when I began. See, we can't fight a good fight if we're not keeping the faith. And if we're not fighting a good fight, we're not keeping the faith. We can't proudly, with God's approval, cross the finish line where he can say, well done, thy good and faithful servant.